Welcome to Mount Prospect Public Library's Library Life. I'm Kathy Cushing. Today we'll enjoy some of the musical masterworks of Italy. We'll also learn about a series of theatrical performances gracing our library in 2016 via the Shakespeare Project of Chicago. And we'll thrill to the tiny antics of Professor Marvel's amazing flea circus. But first, let's discover what goes on behind the scenes here at the Mount Prospect Public Library with a visit to our Technical Services Department. Patrons searching for materials here at the Mount Prospect Public Library may find they are accomplishing their mission with ease due to the workings of this behind the scenes area known as the Technical Services Department. Basically, we have two functions back here. We add all of the records to the online catalog for all the materials that we add to um, the database. And then we also have processors who um, ready the materials for circulation, like they cover the picture books, they slap all the stickers on, they put the RFID tags in, so that's the two functions of our department. Head of Technical Services Rosemary Groenwald supervises a staff of 11 library employees. We have um, three processors and eight catalogers, three of which have library degrees. We are responsible for the integrity of the online catalog. Everything that goes into the online catalog is entered by us. So whether it's a record for a DVD or an ebook, um, we make sure that all the author headings are correct, that the subject headings are correct, that the series headings are correct, that the loan periods are correct. Groenwald and members of her staff are so diligent with regard to cataloging that they have earned distinction from the Name Authority Cooperative Program of the Library of Congress. We are a NACO institution, which means that we, along with the Library of Congress and other libraries that have gone through extensive training, can create access points for like an author or a series or a subject not just for our library but for the national authority file so that libraries all over the world actually then use these headings that we can create. A constantly evolving operation, this library's technical services department works tirelessly to accommodate current trends as well as patron needs. We do add about 30,000 items, new items every year, um, probably about 25,000 of those are new books, and then 6,000 of those are audiovisual materials. Then we probably catalog about another 6,000 ebooks or e audiobooks, so they're called electronic resources. And a couple years ago, we made the conscious decision that we were going to add Spanish subject headings to each of these records. So we have a Library of Congress website that we use that um, tells us what would be an appropriate subject heading in Spanish. Groenwald estimates it takes about four to six weeks for most of these new materials to find their way to the shelves. With patron-centered policies and practices in mind, however, items on hold are the exception. Probably 500 items every month are items that are on hold that we get out in 24 hours. You can learn more about the Library of Congress, the Dewey Decimal System, or the Technical Services Department right here at the Mount Prospect Public Library. For more information, call area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org. William Shakespeare is arguably one of the most famous and well-read playwrights of the English language. 2016 marks the 400th anniversary of his death. Joining me today on Library Life to discuss the Shakespeare Project of Chicago, a theatrical company performing a series of stage readings here at the Mount Prospect Public Library, is artistic director Peter Garino. Welcome. Thanks, Kathy. So nice to have you here today. It's great to be here. Let's start out our discussion uh, by talking a little bit about the premise behind the Shakespeare Project of Chicago. We were founded back in 1995, a group of equity actors who shared a common love of Shakespeare 
we would run into each other at auditions and decided that it would be really cool just to get together regularly to meet, sit around a table and read Shakespeare's plays aloud to mm -hmm. each other. So we got a room at the Burger Park Mansion up on Sheridan Road in Chicago, which is run by the Chicago Park District. And we started to do this meeting, you know, once a week. And during the course of these table readings, um, the building was actually used by other artists as well, by pottery people in the basement, painters, musicians. And people would come and go and walk by our room, and we'd be on a break, and some people would say, would you mind if we just sat in and listened to what you're doing? And of course, actors being actors, uh, we're like, sure. Come <laughs> you want on. to perform, right? Sure, come on mm -hmm. in. Uh, so this went on for a while, and pretty soon the guy who ran the place said, a lot of people are talking about what you're doing. Would you consider coming in like on a Sunday afternoon mm -hmm. and providing a reading to the people in the neighborhood here? And we did, and that's really how we got started. So I often say that we didn't go out looking for an audience. Our audience found us. Mm -hmm. That was 21 years ago, and really the Shakespeare Project uh, grew from there. The premise uh, is still pretty much the same. We decided that we wanted to provide this idea of a, a theatrical reading of mm -hmm. Shakespeare's play, very much focused around the text, and we wanted to provide those readings to the public free of charge. So that's what we continue to do today. We do it with professional actors, members of Actors' Equity Association. Mm -hmm. And our company is funded uh, by uh, individual donors and by the um, various venues where we perform, Friends of the Library organizations and those type of uh, you know, entities. Now, you have been with this since its beginning. Yes. Um, so why are you so drawn to the works of William Shakespeare? William Shakespeare is the greatest writer in our language, and especially today where uh, he is somewhat being marginalized in terms of being pushed out of regular study and things like that, mm -hmm. I think it's more important than ever that we work to preserve um, him, his writings. There's only uh, four of the top 52 universities in the United States that still require Shakespeare to be studied by their English majors. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. and at the high school level, many schools have now basically said that the study of Shakespeare is optional. So mm -hmm. as actors, we really feel it's very, very important to uh, kind of stick up for Will. Of course. And, and hopefully ensure that his legacy is, is uh, sustained you know, from this generation to the next. Now you mentioned um, when I talked to you before that you wanted to get back to the word. You wanted people to really listen to the words uh, of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Well, when you come and see our theatrical reading, there aren't a lot of sets or costumes or properties, which in many ways is very similar to how Shakespeare was performed back in the, the late 1580s and 1590s. So the emphasis is really around his language and the greatness of his verse, his imagery, the, the way his characters think. We provide what we call a very uncluttered reading of the play. Mm -hmm. uh, theater companies today, for one reason or another, get very preoccupied with concept productions and a lot of things that don't necessarily have a lot to do with Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And there's probably lots of reasons for that, but our, our focus is really getting back to the words on the page and the way that the actors bring them to life. And we have a uh, a discussion after every one of our performances where audience members will frequently tell us that they finally understand the play after attending our performance mm -hmm. because of the fact that it is so uncluttered and they are the, his, his ideas and his themes and his characters really emerge in, in the way that our actors present the plays. Peter, for those who are not familiar with staged readings, tell us what patrons might experience when they come to one of your performances. Well, <coughs> there's three parts to our performance. Right. We have a dramaturg who gives an introduction to the play. Right. So you can come in not knowing anything about the play and understand the context when it was written, what was going on in the world. We then provide the performance of the play. 
which generally runs about two hours and 10 minutes, including intermission. Mm -hmm. And then we have a 10 to 15 minute discussion afterwards so that the audience members are able to ask questions and comment. And we call this a kind of 360 degree experience of the play. You can come in not knowing anything about it. You can experience a production of it by professional actors and then ask questions and you know, go through that kind of feedback process uh, to really complete your evening. So no one else really does that, uh, as far as I know, certainly here in the Chicago area. And uh, so that's something that we feel is very unique to the Shakespeare project. Oh, it's a wonderful way to experience Shakespeare, especially if you're not necessarily familiar with the play that's being uh, performed. So tell me a little bit about your actors. You mentioned that they're professional. Is this a company of actors that you work with? All the actors in our company are members of Actors Equity Association, which mm -hmm. is the union of professional actors, the same actors that you'll see at the Goodman Theater, Looking Glass, Chicago Shakespeare Theater, Steppenwolf. Uh, the uh, actors who generally work with us are a core group of individuals that have worked with us over many years. Right. However, we do hold auditions every year at Actors Equity Association, and we're constantly bringing in new people who have moved to Chicago, and again, that for our company is very enriching because we benefit from working with new individuals. And at the same time, our core group of actors have worked together for many years. And there's a great deal of value um, in that ensemble effort that we provide as well. How many actors do you normally bring to a performance? And do they normally have to perform more than one role? We have generally anywhere from 12 to 14 actors working on our shows. Mm -hmm. uh, and so with 12 to 14 in some productions, uh, there still may be some doubling required because right. some of Shakespeare's casts you know, have 40 to 50 speaking parts. Um, some of his uh, comedies, for instance, don't have as large. But again, um, on, on any given play, we'll have gen anywhere, like I said, up to about 14 or 15 um, actors. We also, for the last five years, have had a, an internship program mm -hmm. with Roosevelt University. Wonderful. Where each year on one of our shows, we have a few of the actors from their um, acting conservatory work with us. So they get to work with professional actors, and again, we feel that's part of our education outreach mission to mm -hmm. help develop the next generation of actors. What a great experience for them. So tell me, now you're branching out to libraries. Um, tell me why a library is such a good venue for, for this particular experience. Well, libraries today are so much more than just places where people go to get books. They really are pooling points for the community to, to, to come and, uh, again, access information, whether it's on the internet or take advantage of many of the great programs that Mount Prospect Library, for instance, offers, um, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of arts, education, information. And the, uh, the thing about the library, though, is the public library has always been a place that's been accessible to people, and it's in the community. And because our performances, uh, we don't charge admission in our performances, right. it's, it's really a natural venue uh, for us. And uh, we are very much, again, just to go back to Shakespeare's day, Shakespeare's theater companies, you know, they would go out from London and go and tour the provinces, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And bring the plays out to the suburbs of, of London and Stratford, you know, the community where he grew up and everything. So we're very much in that kind of mode as well. We're, we, we are an itinerant theater company. We don't necessarily, we don't own any property. We don't have a building. We're very much beholding to um, uh, a number of groups that provide us, let's say, free rehearsal space, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So, um, again, nice. that and, and again, the venues, our library venues, are, are you know they provide us with our livelihood in some ways because we do need a a place to perform, and uh, we feel we have uh, you know six really excellent venues right now that are geographically distributed that mm -hmm. uh, really provide us with a, a great platform for what we do. All right, let's talk a little bit about your season this year, the three plays that you're going to be bringing here to the Mount Prospect Public Library, and um, how you choose the plays for each season. Well, how do, how do we choose them? <coughs> uh, we have now, over the past 21 years, 
done every one of Shakespeare's plays at least twice. Wow. Some three, a couple, four times. So there's a kind of rotation that we look at. And generally, it's about nine to ten years between the time that we will do a play again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I look at the, the listing of the 37 plays that we do and kind of see what would be coming up next in terms of the, uh, the rotation, so to speak. But we also try to, at the same time, put together a season um, that is built around some theme or idea. This particular year, the, uh, we started with Julius Caesar in October, and now we're getting into these um, three, three plays that fall more into the idea of Shakespeare's romance works. So here in January, uh, uh, we are going to be doing The Winter's Tale. Right which is a wonderful, uh, wonderful play. And again, the, the romances are from Shakespeare's last period of, of when he was writing. Right. So they're the work of a very mature and reflective genius who is you know, looking at themes like in The Winter's Tale, for instance, of, of, of jealousy, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but in a different way than perhaps he did in Othello. Uh, and then in February, we're doing another one of his romances called Cymbeline. Mm -hmm. um, again, Cymbeline is the king of Britain, and he, he has a daughter from uh, his first marriage who falls in love with a young man, but the young man is not of the same social stature. Gotcha. And the father banishes the fiancé, and he has to leave. And again... This is the point of departure for a plot where we see someone disrupting, you know, a relationship, and and then what happens, right? Because of that. So, uh, and then in April we are doing a, a play called Cardinio. Mm -hmm. Now we're not doing the Shakespeare version of it. We're doing a version that was adapted by Charles Mee and Stephen Greenblatt. Stephen Greenblatt is the um, the great Shakespeare scholar from Harvard University. And once again, we have this incredible plot that emerges from, again, this idea of questioning. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a comedy, but it's also uh, extremely uh, enlightening in terms of what goes on in terms of these relationships. All three of these plays sound fascinating. And what a wonderful learning experience for, yeah. for the patrons of the Mount Prospect Public Library. I'd like to end our discussion by talking a little bit about your mission with the Shakespeare uh, Project of Chicago. Absolutely. So we're really, uh, there's, there's two pieces primarily to what we do. There's the, um, what we do in the libraries, which is providing the free theatrical readings to the public. Mm -hmm. And then our education outreach program, which has a number of components. I mentioned our internship program with Roosevelt University. Mm -hmm. We also have abridged productions of Shakespeare that we bring into the schools. All right, so we have a, a version of uh, Hamlet, which is called 50-Minute Hamlet, mm -hmm. uh, 50 minutes being the length of a class period. Right. We do that show with two actors, one actor that plays Hamlet and the other actor who plays every other part in the play. <laughs> uh, so it's very, very theatrical, and the mm -hmm. kids really, uh, really enjoy it. And then we have a 50-minute version of Romeo and Juliet that we do with four actors, um, two actors that play Romeo and Juliet throughout and then a man and a woman who play all the other uh, supporting roles. So those are our education outreach productions. And then we're also very involved with the English Speaking Union. And the English Speaking Union um, uh, sponsors what's called the National Shakespeare Competition. Mm -hmm. And this is an annual competition for high school students okay, that compete all over the country and then perform at Lincoln Center in New York uh, for the, the finals. Mm -hmm. So Shakespeare Project has been going to high schools and trying to get high schools that haven't participated in the competition to uh, hold their own competition and compete at the regionals here. So that's another thing that we're doing to help uh, elevate the um, importance and visibility of Shakespeare in the schools. Well, it sounds like you're keeping yourself very busy, and I look forward to the productions that you're going to bring to the Mount Prospect Public Library. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thanks for having me. For more information regarding the Shakespeare Project of Chicago or any upcoming Mount Prospect Public Library event, call the library at area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website 
at www.mppl.org. If you would like to brush up your Shakespeare or any aspect of the performing arts, chances are the Mount Prospect Public Library has an upcoming program that suits your interests. Here's a look at a cultural series event shining a spotlight on the piano masterworks of Italy. The 2015 Mount Prospect Public Library Cultural Series takes patrons to Bella Italia with a number of phenomenal programs sure to educate as well as entertain. Pianist Chuck Billington's O Solo Piano, Italian Piano Masterworks, is no exception. They have a program of Italian and of heavily Italian influenced piano compositions. I want the individuals in the audience, first of all, to understand and get a sense for how emotionally charged Italian music can be. I also want to educate them a little bit in terms of what chronologically came when and how the works might link together or were influenced one composer by the other. This afternoon encore presentation provides a well laid out historical overview of each musical composition. We're actually starting in the 1600s, which is when Scarlatti wrote many of his works. Clementi was born the same year as Bach, and then St. Thomas Aquinas, of course, was 13th century, but the Cesar Franck put the Panis Angelicus, or Bread of Angels, to music in the 19th century but it was written in the 13th century. Billington continues his concert, highlighting the influence of French composers on some of his chosen Italian masterworks. The French composers were very taken with Italian musical forms. I have a Barcarolle, which is a Venetian boat song by Gabriel Faure. I have two arabesques by Claude Debussy. I'm playing two works from Debussy's Sweet Bergamasque, and then I'm playing a Tarantelle by Debussy, and I'm ending the piece with kind of a wink and a nod, a piece from 1959 named Volare. Italian music, to, to coin a phrase, is a little over the top with the hesitations, you know, with the libretto, with the cantalina line. Uh, it's difficult sometimes to convey that on a piano. It's much easier, of course, to inflect your voice than it is your fingers. But I think, you know, for the most part, the point comes across regardless. A man of many talents, Billington, who has been playing the piano since the age of five, is also a published author. I have a book uh, that came out several years ago on the 1945 Chicago Cubs, the last year they won the pennant. I have another work coming out on the 1959 White Sox. A reoccurring presenter here at the Mount Prospect Public Library, Billington is happy to be part of the library's month-long cultural presentation. To immerse an audience into all aspects of the culture of a country or a people is a great idea. It's kind of like continuing education for the public. From travelogues highlighting the colorful cultures of Italy to historical novels focusing on the landmarks of this great nation, the Mount Prospect Public Library nonfiction collection is brimming with materials to educate as well as entertain. And now here's Reader's Advisor Jenny Massa with her best book pick from the Adult Services Department. In 2015, Kate Anderson Brower wrote The Residents, Inside the Private World of the White House. It's about several first families that were temporary residents and the staff that cared for them. President John Adams and his wife Abigail were the first to live in the White House in 1800. It had only six habitable rooms and they brought four servants with them. Now there are 96 full-time, 250 part-time resident staff plus two dozen from the National Park Services to care for the grounds. First families pay for all of their own personal expenses, like food, liquor, and dry cleaning. Numerous butlers, maids, and ushers have worked there for many years. One has even served 11 presidents. The staff are very protective of the families, but did share special memories of the good and sad times. Considerate or demanding first ladies, rude or polite presidents, formal or more casual entertaining, and the general working of the house. 
A couple of days after moving in, Michelle Obama met with her East Wing staff and the entire residence staff. She told her staff that they were here before us and they are the ones that make the, this place tick. We are on their ground now. Ronald Reagan <coughs> referred to the White House as an eight-star hotel. This is a history and human interest book. I think you will enjoy the residence. Inside the Private World of the White House by Kate Anderson Brower. Recommendations from the Adult Services Department this month highlight the White House. First Families, The Impact of the White House on Their Lives by Bonnie and Jello relays anecdotes about the presidents, their families, and the famous home in which they reside. To Serve the President, Continuity and Innovation in the White House Staff by Bradley H. Patterson is a comprehensive study surrounding the size, cost, and workings of the contemporary White House team. Inside the White House, Stories from the World's Most Famous Residents by Noelle Grove is a compilation of never-before-published National Geographic and White House Historical Association stories and photographs. For those who prefer something from our DVD collection, Inside the White House, America's Most Famous House, has a tour of the home's private quarters as well as interviews with White House staff members and a behind-the-scenes look at state dinner preparations. And Lee Daniels the Butler is a true story of a White House butler who served eight presidents over 34 years. Recommendations from the Youth Services Department this month focus on pranks, cons, and heists. The Terrible Two by Mac Barnett centers around a master prankster who moves to a sleepy town where he joins forces with a kindred spirit to pull off the biggest prank ever. The Tapper Twins Go to War by Jeff Rodkey uses interviews with friends and enemies as well as other devices like text messages and screenshots to help readers decipher what really happened in a war between pranksters. In How Lamar's Bad Prank won a Bubba-sized trophy by Crystal Allen, a bowling enthusiast teams up with a new friend to acquire lots of cash and the heart of his dream girl. Tricky Vic, the impossibly true story of the man who sold the Eiffel Tower by Greg Pizzoli is the story of a con artist whose greatest scam was to sell an iconic French structure to a scrap metal dealer. And in the Fairy Ring, or Elsie and Francis Fool the World by Mary Lozier, two cousins who are teased because they believe they saw real fairies embark on an elaborate retaliation scheme that catches the attention of the entire world. Finally, here's Youth Outreach Coordinator Claire Bartlett with her best book pick from the Youth Services Department. The Great Green Heist by Varian Johnson. Jackson Green is known for a couple of things, his blazer jacket and red tie, and big scale tricks or cons like the Blitz at the Fitz or incidents like the Midday PDA. But for the past four months, things have been different. After his last con blew up, he's decided to stay on the straight and narrow. That was until he found out that Keith Sinclair is planning on running for student council president against Gabby De La Cruz Jackson's former best friend, almost girlfriend, who kind of hates him right now. Jackson knows he shouldn't get involved, but Keith is known for playing dirty, and he has the greedy principal on his side. So Jackson gets together a group of students, each talented at something different, to make sure the election goes according to plan. And if Jackson wins back Gabby's respect in the process and stays out of trouble, that will just be the icing on the cake. If you like mystery, adventure, and fast-paced stories, check out this entertaining book. Have you ever been to a flea circus? Now's your chance to watch these tiny performers in action. Let's peek in on a Super Saturday crowd pleaser, Professor Marvel's Amazing Flea Circus. It's the greatest show on earth in miniature, and this Super Saturday crowd is marveling at the spectacle. Flea circuses have been around for over 100 years, and that last you know, actual flea circus was in the 1950s in Times Square. And since then, it's become more of a, a throwback kind of a program that uh, it's combined a lot of different genres with magic and pantomime, and, and it's kind of evolved into that. 
Michael Catt, otherwise known as Professor Marvel, who has been serving as the circus's ringmaster for more than a dozen years, gives all the credit to his tiny entertainers. We have uh, a variety of performers. Uh, Madame Sophie walks the high wire. Uh, we have Hercules, the world's strongest flea. New flea in the program, he's from Vegas. His name is Alexander. He's a mind-reading flea. One of our special performers, his name is Pogo. He's a one-legged flea, and he will climb a ladder and dive off a diving board and perform 10 somersaults in the air and create a huge flea-sized splash. And the finale is Victor. He is shot out of a cannon at 90 miles an hour and breaks through a paper hoop and caught by a member of the audience. Audience members help set the stage for a number of interactive theatrical feats. I usually get a, a, a volunteer up and they hold the flea in their hand and the big thing is hopefully hopefully they actually see the flea and I have to cue them sometimes to say they see the flea. Can you see him? No. Say yes. <laughs> yes. There's a lot of shtick to it that the kids don't get but the adults will get and it's fun to see the kids up here actually believing the fleas are real. So it, it works in a lot of different levels. Cat, who has been interested in magic most of his life, enjoys supplying his audience with novel entertainment. I wanted to do something different than the typical magic act. Now, I know this is a magic act. I never mention the word magic. As long as I believe the fleas are real, everybody else does. And at the end of the show, I have a little matchbox, and people come up and actually see the fleas moving around in there, and that's what sells the show. Imagination is a key ingredient in the success of Professor Marvel's amazing flea circus, and instilling it is part of his mission as a performer. My big goal is for the kids to actually think that this is real, because I never dispel that it's not real. Professor Marvel's amazing flea circus is just one example of the many entertaining, informational, and educational events featured here at the Mount Prospect Public Library every month. Don't miss any library programs you'd like to experience. Here's a list of events scheduled in December and January. Reservations are strongly recommended. For more information regarding these events, call area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org. You'll also find a listing and description of all upcoming Mount Prospect Public Library events in your library newsletter preview. It's that time of the year when many of us decide to turn over a new leaf and change ourselves for the better. With this in mind, our Library Life camera today asks the question, what is your New Year's resolution and why? Here are some responses. To get my knees fixed so I don't limp around anymore. Me and my family could have playdates and my friends together. To not make any because I try to do better every day. That wraps up this edition of Library Life. For more information on any of the Mount Prospect Public Library services and events highlighted here, call area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org.